So if I if I were to never touch Elm again, and um, I I, I still think I would I, I still think I've benefited from being an Elm developer because the the focus or the the way that I write Elm is I start by modeling things, right? Really modeling the problem. And I don't think that I've ever done that in any other um, language or platform. It's definitely um, changed the way that I've thought about programming, like for the better. I, I definitely um, think that the way that I write Elm code is just more robust and, and better like the language sort of guided me to do that i don't i don't think that was like a a thing that was just like a you know cultural phenomenon that people just decided to do i think it's like the the experience of using the language i think it just makes me move in that direction and it's a good direction i've actually only ever heard you complain of people using microservices when they shouldn't have done. I don't think I've ever heard you complain of the opposite. So maybe you should talk about when people should actually even consider using microservices, because I don't think I've actually ever heard you state that argument. Microservices aren't like an on-off switch. Um, and people, I think, partly often because we don't you know, or have time to engage with the topic more fully, we like to sort of very clearly delineate things and say, this is this thing and this is that thing. And, you know, we say, I, I, you know, microservice architectures are distributed systems and distributed systems are hard. And the phrase distributed systems are hard is true. And a single process monolithic architecture is not distributed. Well, actually it is. My view is that test-driven development gives us a tool that kind of starts to force you to think a little bit more about about the care that you take with your design and because you, you suffer the consequences and the consequences are that you have these these hard to maintain tests that's that's because the design's poor that's because you've got bad design i want this to be kind of an open playground where people come in and they feel comfortable you know learning these things and, and getting better and at some point maybe jumping into some of those extra design, but absolute design is so, it's difficult. It's difficult for all of us. Like how many people will actually understand, uh, you know, the difficulty of mock-based API design versus mock external. If you can't explain what the structure of the system is and what are the guiding principles of how to evolve it, if you can't explain where it's going to run, how it's going to run, what it means, and if you can't explain how to operate it, you're probably in a bad place. Previously, we've heard lots of people say you don't need to write documentation because you should write self-documenting code, uh, clean code. Um, and there's, this, there's been this big kind of anti-documentation movement over the years. And I think if there's one benefit potentially that's come out of this COVID thing, it's that teams have realized that, oh, everybody's not in the office anymore. They can't have those conversations as easily as they were before. And we've not written anything down, so oops, maybe we should start doing something. I mean, one thing you talk about a bit in the book, which I think has got a lot of, you were just talking about parallels with other, you know, previous technologies, which also is a concern of the places, but strikes me as really important with containers is software supply chain security. So you know, that's the posh name for pulling in all your dependencies. So I think the reason why it feels more complicated in a world of containers is because Every single one of your containers is running with its own set of dependencies. You know, this is one of the wonderful features of containers is you can package up an application and all its dependencies into one image and ship that image around. So every image has its full set of dependencies. Even in smaller systems and simple systems, uh, you still want your system to be mostly up and running and providing as much of the service. Now Elixir uh, as a language gives us tools to uh, address those challenges, uh, gives us, you know, like basic building blocks, very simple in their nature, but uh, very powerful and flexible to approach the challenge of high availability in a systematical uh, fashion.
At least something good came from microservices. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, I'm not as negative on them as you seem to be. So the problem that I have often though, is that when I come in as a consultant to a company, the programmers are not thinking architecturally at all. They're just, they're just thinking about the code that's in front of them and it limits them. It limits what they can do, right? It limits how much they can clean stuff up. It, it limits, there's limits everywhere. So, you know, I write books like this and, and uh, I wrote this one a long time ago, which is, you know, just yeah. chock full of, of this kind of, you know, stuff that you learn the hard way after 15, 20, 25 years. That's one of the reasons why I find it so interesting with a new team to make a future perspective at times. Where a, so a future perspective is, is where you draw a timeline from from uh, now until when the project ends or Christmas or a few months um, in the future. And then you say, well, imagine that you are here in the future and then what happened? Then put re red, green or yellow post-it notes. The things that were great are on the green, the things that were bad are on the red ones and the question marks are the things that were in between on the yellow ones. Subscribe to the GoTo YouTube channel now and join the experts in person or online at any upcoming GoTo conference using the promo code BOOKCLUB. Visit gotopia.tech to learn more.